getting the most out of every ingredient. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid Blender Collection. Hello and welcome to the British Library 2020 food season generously sponsored by KitchenAid. Uh, my name is Polly Russell. I'm a curator at the British Library and I'm the founder and curator of the food season. And this year I've had the absolute delight of working with Angela Clutton as the guest director. And Angela tonight is also this evening's chair for the event Trading Places, which is in partnership with Borough Market. When Angela and I were planning the season we really wanted it to be as eclectic and as relevant as possible and tonight's event which will explore the impact of Covid and Brexit and many other things I'm sure on food and the food we eat food outlets couldn't be more relevant to the moment. Angela Clutton is perfect to be chairing this event. Her debut book, The Vinegar Cupboard, published in March 2019, won the Jane Grigson Trust Award, and in 2020 was shortlisted for the Andre Simon Award and Food Drinks Awards. It won two awards at the Guild of Food Writers and won the debut cookery book at the Fortnum and Mason Drink Award. I feel like it's the most uh, award given book ever. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, she really is the perfect person to host this evening's event, not least because she regularly writes for Borough Market, as well as being their recipe developer, demonstration cook and host of the hugely popular Cookbook Club and Borough Talks podcast series. And she is extremely knowledgeable about the food world. So over to you. And ah, one thing, everybody, we would love you all to send in questions to the panel would love to hear from you. On your um, screen there's a tab with questions so please do submit questions as the event goes on and Angela will come to them no doubt in due course. Over to you now Angela. Thank you so much Polly that was, <laughs> that was quite the intro so thanks ever so much for that. Um, it is an enormous pleasure to be chairing tonight's event um, all about trading places and really thinking about literally what that means about all the places where we get our food, supermarkets, local markets, small producers, delivery services, really looking at all of that. And we have an absolutely great panel who have enormous amount of experience and knowledge and passion about all different aspects of the food system, and all of those things to do with trading places and all about access to food. I am just going to quickly um, whiz around and do some introductions to people um, before we launch into the event proper. So going to start off with Darren Hennehan, Managing Director of Borough Market, um, who with this event is in partnership with. Darren, born and raised on a beef farm in Staffordshire, so roots firmly in the world of food production. Works as trustee of environmental charity Wastewatch, series of government advisory roles, and joined Borough Market in 2016, very much focused on leading the market to the next stage in its evolution in terms of sustainability, seasonality, and innovation. Borough Market itself, barely needs an introduction, is London's oldest food market, not just a source of fantastic British and international produce, but also a place where people come to connect. Um, it's owned by Charitable Trust, uh, run by a board of volunteer trustees, and there's a huge commitment to supporting the local community around Borough Market, um, community events, cooking demonstrations, supporting local community projects and schemes, and I'm sure Darren will talk much more about all of those things um, as we go through. Patrick Holden, come to Patrick next. Founder and Chief Executive of the Sustainable Food Trust, organisation working internationally to accelerate the transition towards more sustainable food systems. Between 1995 and 2010, he was Director of the Soil Association and his policy advocacy is underpinned by his practical experience in agriculture. He is 100 hectare holding, now the longest established organic dairy farm in Wales, where he produces a raw milk cheddar star cheese from 80 native Ayrshire cows. Patrick is a frequent broadcaster and speaker with the CBE for services to organic farming. I feel like with these biographies, I'm sort of barely scratching the surface. I feel like there's so much more I can say about each of you, but we'll, we'll, we'll discover it as we go along. Jenny Linford, food writer and author of over 15 books, including The Missing Ingredient, The Curious Role of Time in Food and Flavour, which um, is an absolutely fantastic book looking at time as the invisible ingredient in food. Also The Chef's Library, featuring the favourite cookbook choices of over 70 acclaimed international chefs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Possibly most personally for um, the talk we're about to uh, delve into, she has run uh, tours of um, London's some of London's 
most interesting uh, food stores. And her first book, Food Lovers London, A Cosmopolitan Guide to London's Food Shops, was originally published in 1991 and is still in print seven editions later. Jenny writes for Sunday Times, Delicious, Modern Farmer, National Trust Magazine, and I have a feeling many, many, many others too. Tasha Makiokora, co-chair of Bite Back 2030 Youth Board. Tasha is passionate about changing the way we talk about obesity and creating equal opportunities for everyone to have access to healthier food options. Bite Back itself is a youth-led movement established by Jamie Oliver. The drive is for healthy, nutritious food to be an option for every child and every young person. Focus is leveraging the power of our communities and reaching out to ensure no one is forgotten when it comes to food, no matter where they live, learning lessons from COVID-19 and using them to redesign a food system that works fairly for everyone. You may have gathered, I sort of nabbed that from the Bike Back website, which I did, and it's a perfect sentence, I think, to lead us into the discussion that we want to get into. And we're going to start by each of our panellists taking five minutes or so to give us their own perspective on a particular aspect of this discussion about trading places. Darren, I'm going to come to you first. Um, for you to talk to us about Borough Market's perspective on everything leading up to COVID and lockdown and then maybe a little bit also about you know what happened when COVID and lockdown hit. So over to you Darren. Thanks Angela. Um, so um, Borough Market's a fantastic place and um, what we do there is focus very heavily on quality food, um, on food from all over the world, um, all the best quality food from absolutely everywhere. Uh, but what underpins it all is an absolute commitment to sustain sustainability um, and promoting ethics in, in, in food and ethics in farming. Um, so what we have is a group of incredibly uh, influential and incredibly dedicated traders that, that, that put together this cacophony of food um, that I think is one of the best places in the world to be. And it's certainly one of the best food markets in the world to, to, and food establishments in the world to be in. It's based on hard work. Um, it's based on agility and innovation um, and ideas um, and beliefs. Um, and all of those things come together into what is a very, very, very strong base, a very strong community, both with our customers, but also with the, the traders and with the trustees. And I work to a group of uh, trustees who are dedicated and volunteers are, are dedicated to the market. And together, what we do is we create this incredibly resilient body of people, an incredibly resilient body of expertise that's been tested over the last few years. We've had two terror attacks. Um, we've had Brexit going on for... God knows long, and, uh, and it seems to still be going on now, um, which is clearly in a market where you are focused on international food is, an, is, a, uh, is, a, is, a, is a big, big issue um, and potentially a, a catastrophic issue for many of our traders. But also that resilience and that hard work and that determination gave us a very strong background when we then came into the latest COVID crisis. And I can remember in March, um, I'd just come back for some time in Canada when my son was at university and I'd come back and um, it felt like the, the ground was sleeping away from underneath our feet because there was one announcement, then another announcement. And, you know, for the people that have been to Borough Market, we have a new hot food area at the back of the, the market. Um, and uh, we took away the big tables, uh, then we took away the small tables, uh, and then we took away the chairs. Um, and then we closed down the hot food businesses and then we closed down um, other aspects of the market as well. And we were suddenly left with, um, with this core, which is our spiritual core and the, the, the reason why Borough Market exists, which is a produce market. Um, and what that produce market did then reacted uh, and it reacted based on what it knows best, uh, which is to supply London and local, local Londoners and um, uh, the people that live in our area. And we have obviously Guy's Hospital just across the road, um, provided those people with healthy, nutritious um, and fantastic quality food. And um, it was really, really heartwarming at the beginning of, 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 of lockdown that many people came out and cycled across London um, 
to then stand in queues for the ginger pig or for um, you know Elsie and Bent to buy their buy their fruit and veg or buy their meat. Um, and really, often we're used to seeing queues outside Padella and we're used to seeing queues outside some of the hot food stands. But to see it outside produce sellers uh, was really really heartening and really reminded us about who we are and, <clears throat> and why produce and why groceries and why cooking food is so important. Because I think that's one of the really good things, if there are good things that can ever come out the COVID crisis is that people did reconnect with food. People had the time to reconnect with food. Many people planted food in their gardens for the first time in ages um, or at all um, and realized just how blooming difficult it is to grow food in your garden. And so that you should have a little bit more respect for, for, for farmers as a result of all of that. But that connection with the food um, meant that people were able to um, probably recognize more the value of food and um, that was done through um, uh, changes in people's attitudes changes in time but also by us adapting and by some of the people that we work with and Angela I'm going to put you into this because Angela moved from a, a cookbook club where she had her own setup and an actual physical place to suddenly doing online and engaging with probably a bigger audience um, than maybe we engaged it before by using new technology and getting that message out there um, and it was it was a, a, a time of hope. And that's done because we're adaptable, uh, we can change, um, we work hard, um, and our customers recognize that. And they keep coming back, and people have a genuine affinity for Borough Market and a genuine affinity for food um, and a genuine affinity for the lifestyle and the and the love of food and the, the sharing of that food with their family. And if that's a positive thing to come out of COVID, which is such an awful period, I think that's a really, really good way. You said so much there, Darren, which I'm dying to ask you about, and I suspect the others on the panel are to kind of dive into, but I'm not going to ruin our format. Um, I'm going to come back to some of those issues that you touched upon, because you're, you're so obviously right. We have a moment where people are more interested than ever before in where their food comes from. Um, and it's what we do with that moment. It, it, it is what we're here to talk about and Jenny I'm going to come to you next because I think it would be interesting if you could you know, perhaps build on what Darren's been talking about and thinking about the role of markets and small producers and how they connect with communities um, and also about supermarkets things as well because if we really want to look at the breadth of you know, food supply and how people get their food um, do you want to take us into that Jenny a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I my first book was about food shops and I am, um, even though I'm a food writer, I'm, I'm a home cook. And I think, you think if you're a home cook, what you want, you know, to cook well is good ingredients. And I think one of the things I've always sort of tried to spread the word about is how diverse food shops are. Um, it's particularly so in London. And my own childhood was spent, I lived abroad as a child. My mother's from Singapore. I lived there for four years, I lived in Italy for three years, through two very strong food cultures. Um, and I got amazing memories of the markets there. And I, th I think it was that nostalgia, um, that understanding of what food means for expatriate communities, which probably led me to come up with this idea for Food Lovers London, which looked uh, at sort of multicultural food shops in London at a time when multiculturalism wasn't sort of as fashionable. Um, so the book came out in 1991 and it was this amazing, sense. I think one of the things I'd like to say is that, you know, yeah, supermarkets are very dominant in Britain and they are incredibly convenient and widely used, but there is a whole array of different types of food shopping that takes place. And actually, especially within different communities um, in London, this is one of the things that struck me walking around was, was there was a real character, you know, you go into, um, you know, a Cypriot greengrocer and it's, it's things that are, you know, very proudly sort of imported from Cyprus, wonderful fresh vegetables and the grains and the pulses, you sort of feel, a, you know, you feel a country's culture through its cuisine and you feel that cuisine through its food shops. Um, it's very interesting because those community food shops in London, whether from Chinatown or Brixton Market or the Japanese supermarkets, they were selling to their communities. So very different from the restaurants, you know, the restaurants opened by expatriates in London are often selling food to people not from their community. But the food shops were, were really had this incredible range. It's that really interesting thing. You go to Chinatown, you will see things in those shops that are never on menus in Chinatown for English people. Um, so so I, I, I find that absolutely fascinating. And I, sort of my message is, it's funny, I do these tours around food shops and I did them 
to try and get people to understand that under their nose in the West End, in Soho. So Soho, especially when I started doing these talks about 20 years ago, you know, famous for its, you know, quite sleazy, famous for sex shops. And I was like, you know, hello, they're lovely, lovely food shops in Soho. Soho has some of the oldest food shops in London. And I took a group round yesterday, um, some cookery students, and they just said, I've walked up and down Old Compton Street. I'd never noticed the Algerian coffee store, you know, which is founded in the 19th century by an Algerian businessman is still going, this beautiful old vintage coffee shop. And I've always heard that every time I've done my tour, people just are rushing around. They don't notice they're gems, you know, we're, we're blessed. And markets have a huge vitality, which obviously Darren spoke about. Um, and I think one of the things I'd like to, to point out is that markets are really important for communities um, because they often, you know, if you think of Queen's Market in Newham, Queen's Market in Newham is probably the most diverse market in London in terms of different communities who are there. And it offers a starting point, you know, an, an affordable starting point because rent is such a massive issue, isn't it? If you think about shops and access, you know, what's happening in our high street, where are the shops that can afford to stay there. So a market, a market pitch is a more affordable way to start. It's really, really important. I've been I'm involved in campaigns over the years. I was involved in a campaign to save Queen's Market from a very, very unsympathetic development um, that would have put a supermarket on the site. This really vibrant market just sending ingredients, you know, not one bit of, not even food to go, literally just cheap, affordable, fresh ingredients for all the very different communities in Newham. So I just, you know, I think we should have, we should really sort of treasure what we've got. And, and the way you do that is by shopping, you know, spread your money is always my message, actually. Thanks, Jenny. Um, it's so, it's a lovely kind of thing to, to lead us more in something. And I'm going to come to Patrick now. And also I want to make the point that uh, there may be many things that connect Jenny Linford and Patrick Holden, but I'm going to leap on cheese as being the most immediate <laughs> Of them possibly because Jenny did a lot of work when lockdown first hit about supporting the work of British cheesemakers and Patrick as I said in my introduction um, works in cheese, produces cheese. Um, so Patrick I'm going to come to you um, for you to talk to us you know, maybe from that small producer's perspective about trading places and how 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 it happens of getting things out and what the well I'm not going to tell you what you're going to say you tell what you're going to say. Well thank you very much um, I I'm a, a dairy farmer, uh, still milk the cows quite regularly. Um, and we produce from 80 cows um, a raw milk, cheddar style cheese, mature for about 12 months. And I'm so happy that it's uh, being sold in Borough Market and has been ever since we started making it. it. Makes me feel very proud to say that. During COVID, it was very interesting because even provenance and localness. Uh, a lot of our cheese is going abroad, um, to, even to Australia. Um, and then, of course, a lot was going to restaurants. Some still is, but an awful lot less. Um, and when COVID struck, we, uh, we had to stop making cheese for social distancing reasons in the workplace and demand more or less froze for a, a complete month and more. But amazingly, due to the kind of incredible innovation of people getting food to people who want it, a lot of online stuff, a lot of very committed um, wholesalers and retailers, Neil Yard Dairy obviously being amongst them. We're, our sales have now returned almost, but not quite, pre-COVID levels. And I think the direct sales, people who are craving a better story behind their food, are probably the reason behind this. I think that the pandemic has really made people think about the story behind their food and provenance. And it's interesting to think that if you go to a supermarket today and you try, you have a buying prescription, I'll only buy food if I know who produced it, how, whether the production system was sustainable, where it was produced, and all that information would inform my buying choices. You could go out with very little food indeed. And I think one of the great challenges today is to reconnect um, citizens who want to buy better food with its provenance in a way which can go to scale, not so easy. And of course, yesterday, Minette Batters, the president of the National Farmers Union, a very good woman who's real campaigner, met Boris Johnson at number 10. And they had a discussion about, you know, lower standard imports and what's going to happen. And I don't know exactly what happened. You could imagine he made some sort of bland reassurances to her that they wouldn't lower standards, but I shouldn't think it was in print. And really it's up to us now 
to make sure that the changes we need to make in our food systems to address climate change, biodiversity loss, all the things which are threatening the planet right now, they're going to play out on the farms because as Vandana Shiva, the great Indian food campaigner, pointed out last year at a talk I heard her give, the world used to be covered with pristine wilderness. Now it's mostly covered with farms and the farming systems aren't very good at the moment. But if we, the food consumers and citizens of planet Earth, uh, use our electoral power and our buying power to insist on good provenance from all the food that we buy, um, including in borough market, of course, um, then the world will change because we are the powerful ones. We are the cells of the food system. If we change, we can transform our food system. And I think there's a lot of grounds for optimism because even if Dominic Cummings doing his algorithms in the back office of number 10 thinks that there simply aren't enough of us who care deeply enough to worry the prime minister getting re-elected next time, I think we need to prove him wrong. I think we need a massive campaign around food provenance and about relocalizing our food systems, local in a broad sense, because if the provenance is intact, food can travel some distance. But I think this is gonna happen. I think there's a consciousness shift going on. and Maybe that's one of the silver linings of COVID. Thanks, Patrick. That's absolutely great and very um, inspiring as well. Um, and uh, I suspect the use of the word supermarket um, is a nice segue into what Tash is going to talk about, because I think, you know, I know, Tash, you've been doing a lot of your campaigning and work with, with the supermarkets. So it's interesting you know, to build perhaps what Patrick was just talking about, people having buying power. I mean, we are, you know, choice and obviously we will, will we will come into aspect of you know, we're also at a time where people are really struggling to be able to make choices about food so we obviously do need to you know, hugely factor that in but Tasha maybe you'd like to to take up the baton. Fantastic thank you so much for the introduction after everyone has spoken I don't really know what to say um, <laughs> yeah so one of the reasons why I joined Bite Back was because I wanted to change the way that we discuss and talk about obesity um, often the debate is solely focused on the role of the individual so it, places an emphasis on the idea of it's their choice therefore it's their fault and it fails to acknowledge how the food environment in which people live in has dramatically changed and our obesity epidemic is the result of an ob um, obesogenic environment that promotes unhealthy calorie rich and just high fat salt and sugar kind of food and so I really wanted to talk about the role of supermarkets and delivery services that they have in providing good quality healthy and affordable food in our post or mid COVID-19 world and my aim is to make sure that junk food and other you know high fat salt and sugar options are taken out of the spotlight and that a light is, sh is shone on healthy food and drinks at a really good affordable price. Um, everybody knows about you know price promotions whether that's a temporary price reduction, a buy offer such as you know buy one get one free or offering extra free you know um, play t times when the manufacturer creates a larger pack a size and states that you know a portion of the product is free so it might say 20% extra coca-cola for the same price and that is those kind of promotions is the key driver of grocery shopping behavior and consumer spending I think the large part of price promotion as well a lot of evidence does indicate that these price promotions are typically placed on less healthy options which obviously encourages the purchase of health um which undermines the purchase of healthy food and drinks and ultimately undermines any effort that has been placed into improving the kind of foods that people are, are supposed to be eating. Um, yesterday, I had the, uh, the privilege to talk to a Tesco representative at the Feed Britain Better uh, Youth Summit by Backpack. And prior to speaking to them, we'd looked on their website and they had 2,327 items on offer, of which only 106 was on unhealthy drinks. So that included fizzy drinks and your sports and energy drinks. 72 offers were on chocolates, 59 offers were on sodas, and only four offers were on fresh fruit and vegetables. And so this idea of, oh, it's the person's fault, it's, they should be deciding what they're eating, when the odds are so stacked up against you and are clearly um, used to encourage you to consume these kinds of foods, we cannot blame people when it's clearly that, when it's really easy to get food that is unhealthy. And, and when we look at food that is fresh and nutritious for us, it is absolutely unaffordable for the majority of people. And so when 
especially when we're looking against you know the flood of unhealthy food options that pour up from the high streets the supermarkets for children and young people especially young people who are at school I know my school canteen like I said this option is completely taken away and so the question becomes what is the role for the likes of Tesco's and other retailers in using price promotions to give healthy nutritious food a starring role in our minds we know that obese people are significantly more likely to become seriously ill or admitted to intensive care because of COVID-19 compared to those with a, perhaps a healthier BMI. And while the role of supermarkets before COVID has always been to try and promote healthy food and healthy eating and healthy choices, this is a this has become more and more, more and more important now that we have COVID in the space. And I think even when I was speaking to Tesco's yesterday, they were very adamant to say, no, 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 our ratio of unhealthy food and healthy food price promotions is about 50-50. It's clearly not the case because we wouldn't have this um, obesity epidemic if we were to... Uh, if that was if that was what was happening in the real world and I'm really glad that Jenny also spoke about you know access to healthy and affordable foods in her local market in the local area another issue that I think COVID has been able to highlight is the issue of food deserts um, the coronavirus has made it harder for everyone to buy foods and other essential items you know under lockdown orders and social distancing guidelines and limited delivery slots for online groceries but even before the pandemic millions of people in the UK were struggling to access groceries and the problem has only gotten worse more than a million people in the UK live in food deserts and that is essentially neighborhoods where access to affordable healthy food options especially fruit and veg is restricted and non-existent due to like the absence of supermarkets or grocery stores I'm really lucky I live in um southeast london southeast london and i have a local fresh food market literally about 10 20 minutes ago and i know that is a very rare feature of a lot of london boroughs and even just the uk in general so i've been able to get access to fresh food and i just want that to be the experience of all young people of everyone you know nearly one in ten of the country's most economically deprived areas are food deserts and it's you know, research does say that typically large out of town housing estates and deprived inner cities are served by a handful of small and relatively expensive corner shops. So when you don't have access to a supermarket, like the likelihood is you probably have a local corner store nearby. And we know that getting fresh fruits and vegetables from your corner store is very, very expensive compared to, you know, going to your supermarket. And so we think a lot of uh, myself and Bite Back as well, we really do want to emphasize the importance of having access to food that is nutritious, nutritious and affordable as well. And this way, this comes in, this is where I bring in the role of um, delivery services. I think delivery services could work with high, with healthier suppliers and offer discounts on healthier options, but also in the way that they advertise, you know, during lockdown, we did see a reduction in junk food advertising from the likes of, you know, Just Eats and Uber Eats. And it shows that clearly these companies as well um, are able to reduce the amount of advertising that is targeted towards unhealthy eating habits and actually replace those adverts with healthier alternatives so it is possible so when people talk about you know oh there's going to be a loss of revenue if we introduce the 9 p.m watershed no honestly companies are just going to replace their adverts with healthier options and that is really what bite back is trying to push how do we encourage and how do we place an account accountability and responsibility for companies to make sure that they put health a lot higher on the priority list because we do know that these companies are businesses so their main priority is profit profit how is it that they're going to generate and increase their revenue so my my ask for the food industry really is to you might not want to place you know health at the forefront of your operations but it certainly needs to be up there alongside profit brilliant <laughs> I wish we had such a longer session to all the food because you've all said so much recently. Are we allowed to applaud Tasha, by the way? Yeah, 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 yeah I'm already looking at the clock thinking we have so much to talk about. Um, but I wonder if someone, any of you, and I think maybe you, Darren and Patrick, particularly you guys, because you're, you're, you're so much uh, working this aspect of things, would like to respond you know, to what Tasha you know, has just talked about. Um, Patrick, I might come to you first for that, possibly. Well, I think one of the... Uh, reasons why it's so hard to get healthy food at affordable prices is that current food pricing is dishonest. We mm. produced a report in 2017 called The Hidden Costs of UK Food. And basically the headline uh, of the report was for every pound we spend on food, apparently cheap food, there's another hidden pound 
split about 50-50 between damage to the environment, you know, the destruction of biodiversity, climate change, that sort of stuff, and damage to public health, which doesn't appear on the price of the food. So the problem is that when people farm in a healthier and more sustainable way, they're up against this economic headwind where they are not incurring the, those damaging hidden costs to society, which we're already paying for through our taxes, NHS costs, you know, water companies taking pesticides out of the water, that kind of stuff. But since it doesn't appear on the price, we're having to compete with these apparently cheap food producers. And it's not fair. It's actually really a scandal that this has gone on for so long. And governments don't want to apply the polluter pays principle because they think, and they may be right, I refer to Dominic Cummings, that, you know, they're worried about food prices going up. And actually what we need to do is pay the true cost of food. And if people in food deserts with low incomes can't afford good food, nutritious food, which ought to be the right of every citizen, then governments have a responsibility to intervene and do something about that, not keep this dishonest trading environment where people are literally being made sick by this mm -hmm. low standard food they're buying, causing obesity, diabetes, probably cancers, lots of food intolerances. It's not acceptable and it's got to change. And I think, Tasha, you are brilliant and you're doing a great campaigning job. And we need you to be at the forefront of the campaign for better food in the future. Yeah. Darren, yeah. I'm going to come to you to build on that because sure. you, know, like me, I'm sure, as soon as you, you know, say you work at, or you do work with um, someone like Bro Market, people say, oh, but it's so much more expensive than a supermarket. But, but the point is, is that it's an alternative, isn't it? And, you know, so much of the, the food landscape is dominated by very, very, very large players. Um, all of the food in the UK goes through about five or six buying desks. It, it, it's a cartel. It's a monopoly. And um, it's not just about um, creating a point of difference, but it's also about making that difference then sustainable. And what you find, not just in markets, but actually, Tasha, there are some healthy local corner shops and there are lots of very, very good greengrocers around the place. Um, but they're often in the wrong place and they're often in areas where where um, they're seen as a luxury rather than a necessity. And I think that there is a huge, huge agenda here for us just to say to it to ourselves really that you don't have to be a victim of the major multiples you don't have to only eat the four varieties of apples that are in supermarkets you don't have to only ever buy farm fish you can buy wild fish that's been sustainably cooked sustainably caught uh, you can eat a more natural diet uh, you can eat with the seasons um, and guess what when you do it's cheaper it's healthier and it tastes better and, you know, Jenny's point about cultures being celebrated through food. Many, many, many cultures in, in this country know this already. Um, but unfortunately, because the system is so dominated by those big players, they often can't get access to the, 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 the ingredients that they need in order to be able to cook healthy, sustainable food. But it's 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 pervasive. And, you know, frankly, it's it's evil because you get advertising bans against children uh, being exposed to junk food. But what Burger King did is they sponsored a football team and that football team then went on to FIFA, um, you know, the FIFA, the video game online. Uh, and then, of course, all these kids are playing the football game on their PlayStations. And all they can see is Burger King ballooned across the the, the, um, the, the chests of that, those, football, uh, those football teams. And then they back that up with a little bit of clever stuff on social media. So people got rewards if they went into Burger King. They do it. It is systematic and it is pervasive and it is wrong. It is morally offensive and it should be criminally offensive as well because these country, these companies are exploiting people and they are breaking the rules and breaking the law so that they can promote their product. And us as a society just need to say this isn't good enough. Um, I could rant about lots of other things as well. I hope at some point, <laughs> Angela, well, we, come on to plastic, but, but, it's wrong, but it's wrong and um, something should be done about it. And this is a political will thing to be able to challenge some of those very, very, very large, very powerful agri-petrochemical agri food businesses. And this is only gonna get worse if we do a deal with America to import all of this stuff. Um, the, 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 the way in which you solve food poverty isn't by just making um, food cheaper, 
it's about actually about challenging poverty in itself and that's about respect and it's about um, wages and it's about uh, access to opportunities if covid's done one thing it's shone a great big light on the massive inequalities in this country and food is one of the big symptoms of that and you saw that in the early stages lockdown where some of the more vulnerable people literally couldn't get access to food and were forgotten by society and it's just wrong just frankly wrong and we should be ashamed of ourselves as a, as a community uh, to allow that sort of thing to happen um, but this is a massive, massive political thing. And at the same time in COVID, the pieces of legislation like the agriculture bill are going through and slipping through so hardly noticed uh, because of all the things that's going on with COVID. This country needs to have a proper food policy and this country needs to have a proper food act that preserves those rights, that preserves the rights uh, of citizens to access to proper, healthy, sustainable food. Um, and without that debate, without people like you, Tasha, and to be frank, like, like the rest of us as well, frankly, getting a little bit angry about this, then nothing's going to change because it's wrong. Um, and what we are doing is we're not just making ourselves ill. We are dividing ourselves as a society and, decided that, and dividing ourselves of communities with something around food, which should bring us all together. And it's just it, we, sorry, I'm starting to rant here, so I'm going to no, stop. No, 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 but no, it, it's, it's it, just really, really offensive what goes on in the food industry. Yeah, um, and I think and the you're, big completely, players. you're completely right, obviously, Darren, that when you know, COVID hit, it threw, it, the, the focus became so much upon food access initially and then mm -hmm. through from that into thinking you know, a bit more about your know, food productions and small producers and things and you know Patrick you mentioned something earlier we've you know, been talking about you know, political will and those things but you were also saying Patrick that you know, pe people can kind of you know in their buying choices impact upon this as well and Jenny I'd like to come you know, to you if you know to talk a little bit about that you know that moment when Covid you know first hit and what happened with the supermarkets about people not being able to get things or you know all, all of that you know, sort of stockpiling and then people attitudes towards getting food what they were able to do and then and, and the role of small producers and markets kind of all interplaying into that in that sort of march april may period yeah i mean it's very interesting and you're absolutely right darren that you know the the terrible inequalities in our society i think are very um highlighted because of this crisis um what was striking for me i thought was you know all those pictures of empty shelves in supermarkets and yet a lot of the small shops these shops that I've always written about, these independent shops, they still had food stock. You know, it was, it was like, oh, I need flour. Oh, you know what? My local Turkish shop still had it, you know, way after the supermarkets had, had run out. Um, so that sort of vibrancy, which again brings my point that we need a diversity of different sort of shops. The markets are really interesting because actually, and we know how important it is to be outdoors now to fight coronavirus. You know, we're living... You know, we're now eight months further down the road. It hasn't gone away. It's not going away. You know, we have to think, we have to think of how do we live with it? Shopping outdoors is a really basic, interesting way of staying much safer. And you would have thought that markets around Britain could have sort of stayed open and flourished. And sadly, a lot of them closed down because mm. um, councils were really wary. People worried about distance. Um, but I, I wrote an article from my website, just out of interest, because I wanted to know what was happening. And there's this wonderful um, in Kent where most of the, market, the farmers markets closed, but one in Shibham stayed open because the man who ran it was just incredibly organised. And I sort of wished he was in government because he was just really efficient. And he came up with a, a sort of a, a, a drive through farmers market. He went online, he got funding. He'd sort of it the year before because he thought it'd be great for commuters. He hadn't got the funding. When the crisis broke, he managed to get some funding, put it online, allowed people to... to um, to shop and set up this incredible system, you know, where one family, one family group sorted the orders, another family group to get the cars. And it's worked really well and it, he's sustaining it now because it's just a, a safe way of shopping. And of course, that those markets that stayed open, like Orchard Market in the Northwest, which has always um, sort of highlighted local food producers and supported them, that stayed open in a, in a sort of minimized way. Um, because a lot of it was about eating out, but that went, but it was food. And um, these were lifelines. I interviewed the producers, you know, if they hadn't had that market, I talked to one farmer and, you know, of his, the nine markets that he had um, sold at, he only had one. The only one was Altrincham. So if that, mar and he's there, he's a farmer. So you know about that, Patrick, you know, he's like, you know, the livestock are there, but, you know, it has to be fed, you know, that's has to be fed. The, the work that goes on a farm has to be carried on. All, you know, your fuel bills, your, your expenses, your, your staff, 
that all carries on. So you need to make money, you know, and all sustain it. So, so I think that sort of vibrancy of markets, um, you know, and in fact, the range, you know, Borough, you know, which I've, I've, you know, I went to the very early days of Borough when it was every third Saturday of a month and just watch it grow and grow. And I, and I know how important it is for food producers to have access, you know, to markets and farmers markets often get a very bad press and they're written off as sort of, you know, privileged middle class indulgence. And I just know from talking to producers across the country that actually those farmers markets are really important because they give them revenue. They get, they meet their customers, they get feedback, they try, you know, here's a new cheese, what do you think of this? They get feedback. Um, and often people enjoy it. I think we just remember, you know, food is a pleasure, isn't it? You know, this is one of the reasons why I've written about it for, you know, I love it. You know, nearly 30 years of writing about food, it's, it's, and it brings people together, as we were saying. Um, I think that's that sort of the joyful side of it is something that we should hold on to. Um, and it's really precious. So if we're talking about supermarkets, um, as Sasha was saying, not having enough you know, good food, healthy food, well-produced food that have on the supermarket aisles as an option for people when they're going up and down. Um, I wonder why from both perspectives and the supermarket perspective and a small producer's perspective, how those connections don't happen, I suppose. Um, Tasha, you, you were talking earlier about you know, having conversations with Tesco and I'm sure other supermarkets as well as part of your campaigning. Is that something which comes up about the way supermarkets deal or don't with smaller producers? Hi, um, that, with the conversation with Tesco yesterday, it was very much centred around, you know, we do provide option and we work together. It's very, you know, they, they, in their eyes, they didn't see any problem in terms of, you know, the way that, you know, they present food or the kind of food that they get in. It was very, it, I didn't get the sense that there was any community work. So they weren't in touch with like local stores and other, you know, stakeholders within the local community that they could work together. It was very much Tesco's. We are, you know, one of the biggest retailers in the whole world. It's very much us, it's very much us and then we're serving the community. Yeah. Um, but I do agree in terms of like you know supermarkets and local com communities working together to make these healthier options more available and accessible for everyone and I think it's definitely something that the food industry could could work on and improve on. Yeah Patrick um, I think I've heard you speak before about um, the relationships and the uh, how things work between farmers and producers and supermarkets and uh, the challenges uh, of, of Getting, get, getting what we're talking about in terms of good food, healthy food into supermarkets. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Well, I think this is a really crucial issue because one of the things that the supermarkets have done during my farming lifetime is they've, they used to source relatively regionally and locally. And just to give you an example, I was a carrot grower for many years supplying supermarkets, but then they progressively closed down all their pack houses, mm. some of which used to be available for producers in the West Country and Wales like myself, until eventually they only had one pack house for all the carrots, for instance, that they sold. And in our case, that was Peterborough, 230 miles away from this farm. So we had to give up. But if you look at all the foods they sell, say the beef or the lamb, the lamb, for instance, that one or two very well-known supermarkets um, source, all comes from an abattoir down the road from here. But that includes the lamb that comes from Scotland which is a terrible story. And if you are now going to ask supermarkets to source more locally and regionally, they've destroyed all the infrastructure that used to enable people to get local food into their, into their supermarket. And actually, we are going to host a meeting with Welsh supermarkets quite shortly with the National Farmers Union. And I hope that it's going to encourage them, let's put it in the positive way, uh, to rethink the way they source their food. Because at the moment, I think it's in, in a very bad state. And also, just the number of young people who are going vegan or vegetarian, part of it, I think, is their, their feeling that they don't want to be any part of an industrialised livestock system, which, of course, is absolutely right. But they need to be able to differentiate between the animals which are part of the problem, which is mainly industrially produced chickens and pigs, and the mainly grass-fed ruminant animals like cattle and sheep and dairy cows that are grass-fed and on small family farms, mm -hmm. which are not just part of the solution. They're essential if we're going to support the shift towards more sustainable and regenerative farming systems. Because if we're going to give up nitrogen and pesticides and all those kind of chemical inputs, you have to go back to what's called mixed farming, which is based on crop rotations with the fertility building element 
And that fertility building element is normally grass and clover. And the only way you can turn that into food, and it might be 50% of the crop rotation, even in the east of England, is to have grazing animals on it. So this is a very complicated question, but we need to get these issues widely discussed. And then we need to use our buying power to support those farming systems in the marketplace. And that's yep. another issue, of course. The labelling is not very good at the moment. Yeah. Uh, before we go to that, Patrick, sorry, before we, can, I, can I just bring Darren in? Because you, you, Darren, you, you're very keen to, to chime in. Well, I think there's a place as well, because we've spoken a lot about markets as retail markets, but there's a big place here for the wholesale markets. And if you look what happens yeah. in places yeah. like France and Spain, there is a whole network of, of wholesale markets where the supermarkets actually do buy from. Uh, but also, if you want your local corner shop to sell better, food, uh, better, better fruit and veg or better meat or whatever else, they need to have an alternative supply mechanism to be able to get it to them because right. they're not, they can't do what Tesco's do, which is to buy a whole field of, of, of corn before it's even been planted. Um, what they have to do is they have to buy in smaller quantities from from wholesalers and and I think there is a there is some positive signs and I think there is a this yeah. is where I talk about a, a, a food policy there is there is some positive signs within within when wholesale markets uh, there's a very strong um, uh, wholesale market up in Yorkshire um, and um, that supplies uh, right the way across Yorkshire and into Lancashire and they do a very very good, good job up there uh, but we need more of those and we need uh, we need more support for them because often they are owned either by local authorities or by, you know, uh, sort of like arm's length government bodies and they're expensive places to run. Um, when I went across to uh, Belgrade about a year and a half ago, uh, the government there, which isn't necessarily a particularly wealthy, fantastic country, you know, I mean, they haven't, they're not exactly um, as, as wealthy as our society is, had put an enormous amount of money into building a very, very large uh, wholesale market right next to their airport because they knew that what they were produ producing there was too much for their own country and they would be able to export it export it out and we need to have we need to have those sorts of interventions and, and investments as well to create an alternative food network an alternative food system to the one that has been dominated so much by by the very very small number of people who buy most of the food in in, in the uk Often what wholesale markets can be is a little bit of a, a funnel for food grown in Holland and uh, other parts of Europe. And I think if there's one thing that could be beneficial that could come out of Brexit is that we do turn those systems round a little bit uh, so that it becomes much more of a, uh, uh, an entry point uh, for British produced food uh, as well. Thank you, Darren. Um, we need to go to questions um, from uh, our audience because we have we have many of them. So I'm going to dive into this. Um, the first one is um, aimed square at you, Tasha. So coming coming to you for this. Um, we have a lady who's saying a parent of a teenager who and it's always encouraged a teenager to eat well and uh, they mostly eat home cooked food at home. But if you think she has shares in Pringles or Doritos in the packets I find on her bedroom floor. What strategies does Tasha suggest parents use with their teenage children to lure them away from fast and processed food and take an interest in their diets? A great question. I mean, for me, the way that my mom got me into, you know, more healthier diets is genuinely she just cooked healthy meals at home. And so that was normal for me. So when I got to school and I was speaking to friends and they were like, oh, yeah, the chicken and chip shop down here, da, 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 all these things were like, of Norway oh, guys what are you doing what are you talking about you know so for me it's definitely I do encourage all my friends all peers as well and I think that's one thing that Jamie's been really good at is encouraging young people he's got um mm. the new book out seven ways to cook and so that looks at just having normal ingredients and different ways that you can cook it and make it exciting so that kind of things just making cooking fun I think Jenny spoke about her being at home chef I love that you know I look up YouTube tutorials and make how to make this and how to make that and so for me it's kind of like a social thing I get friends over post pre-covid um get friends over and we do cooking sessions together you know that's fun for me and it's a social element for it and I think that's that's another thing for young people when they meet you know at their local um, a fast food store it's not because they want the fast food it's because it's a, so it's a social thing for them uh -huh. what's different from you know the 90s and the 80s is that well, there's not a lot of open space for young people to hang around with after school to you know do activities and so the only thing that they've resulted in is 
we meet after school at this place and on the, along the way we pick up you know this to eat and so when you have like a high street that's completely plagued with junk food stores you don't really have much option in terms of like, what is it that we're going to eat when we get to the park so yeah definitely encouraging just cooking at home making new meals trying out new recipes make it fun make it sociable and I think everybody will be cooking soon yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, Jenny, we've got one for you, um, which is very much about independent shops, especially in London from the questioner. Um, Recognising you've been working, you know, looking at that for more than 20 years and asking what are the biggest changes you've seen? Um, so in, you know, independent shops, um, and do you feel optimistic about the future for such shops? Well, that is, I mean, the sad thing is that I, I looked at the first edition of Food Loves London in 1991 and I was saying, if we don't, you know, these shops are under threat because rents are going up. I mean, so sadly, I think some of those very negative things, um, you know, high rents, congestion charge um, is a massive issue. You know, I think London, the whole parking thing, uh, how do people who, you know, if you're buying food and you want to buy quantities of it, you probably, you know, transport is an issue. And uh, so that's just sort of watching that, that change over the years. And what I've noticed is those shops in Soho, the older ones that I talk about the Italian Denny's, they were sort of community shops and actually very remarkably affordable. It's one of the feedback I always get from people. It's like, oh, I never, I always thought it'd be expensive. I'm like, no, no, look, you know, look at the price of this, these almonds and compare them to a supermarket price. They're actually cheaper, you know, and better, um, you know, certainly on a par. It's very interesting, but I've noticed that the new shops that have opened up, the new food shops in Soho are treat shops, which is really sort of telling of our times, I think, you know, so it's like, any Claire specialist, beautiful chocolate, wonderful donuts, you know, uh, and that is so it's sort of, you know, those the, the everyday shops for me, those shops which I really love um, that are more rooted are being driven out. So I think, you know, rent is a massive issue in terms of optimism. So which we can be as well is I do think I'm always encouraged. And it's lovely to hear you, Tasha, talk about your love of food and cooking, because when I go to markets of all sorts around London, it's always, I love seeing the fact that I see young people there, you know, and that's, um, and, you know, shopping for food. And I think this is thing that when I started writing about food, it was actually really odd to be interested in food in the early nineties, it was actually quite eccentric. And now, you know, I think there is an interest in food. And I think it's sort of got a, you know, look at Instagram, look how much food there is, you know, people like food. I think there is this idea that, you know, and Jamie's been a great ambassador for that, I think, of making it accessible. So I know you and all these lovely young men I know who are all making sourdough. You know, that was unimaginable. <laughs> you know, my the young men I knew when I was in my dreams, they weren't making sourdough. And so I sort of feel like there is, you know, if we can yeah, tap into that sort of interest in food and, and make it accessible and, and, yeah, that joy of it, you know, that the fun of it. And if you control it, you know, cooking is control about what you put in your mouth, which I think is really important. Mm, brilliant. Um, this is one which I suspect is going to start with you, Darren, but then I'd like to kind of move around the group as well. Um, talking about markets, um, not specifically by market, broadly about food markets, um, and positing that they're a place not to justify food, but also a place of social purpose and environmental purpose, social interaction, community cohesion. Um, and the questioner is wondering about how that is managed during such moments of you know, intense pressure in the system and whether those things uh, can be continued and protected and whether or not they matter. Well, absolutely. And, and markets, you, one of the joys of them, um, unless it's throwing it down with rain on a Wednesday in, in March, is that there's very, very little infrastructure. Um, so you can adapt and change and you can reflect uh, your local community incredibly easily. Um, and I would argue that, that, that often market traders are more in contact and more in touch with what's needed in the local community than a lot of, a lot of the others of uh, the other sort of more majors are. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a kind of, um, it's a great opportunity when um, you're able just to uh, pull up one day with a van full of stuff and to open it up and see if it sells because you get absolutely immediate feedback uh, because it either sells or it doesn't sell. Um, and and sometimes in a way that's what creates that kind of leveling and that 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 understanding because um, it becomes relevant to the local community, the community find it and uh, they then develop a shopping habit where they go there um, and then something survives and something flourishes, you know, Borough Market uh, flourished because 
because people discovered it and because people liked it and they kept coming back and it became part of their life um, and that's the same with 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 all uh, with all retail outlets particularly ones that are based very closely in and and, and um, uh, uh, very close to their local community so it can be quite an organic thing it can be quite a sort of natural thing that evolves um, in some instances you have some very very forward-looking local authorities um, that are in touch with their with their local community and uh, are able to attract both the facility uh, by the facilities uh, but also are able to attract the talent that's needed to be able to make that critical mass that gets the market going or or gets either the street market or the the covered market uh, going um, and that's often because you've got some very charismatic individuals within there that say hold on a minute I've got these great ideas I want to do something that looks like a good place to start off and they go there and then people come around um, I always say that that market traders uh, their best part of their market research is to see what other people sell uh, and if it that's selling they then go along and they sell more of it so it's very organic but I think there's also a real place for particularly local government um, and there's some very good people in local government that are making uh, markets important. Um, in London, uh, the mayor has established a markets board uh, to try and coordinate all of this stuff um, and to really give markets and their link to communities uh, a real focus. Darren, I think you have um, helpfully answered another question once you're answering the, the first one, because um, we have someone else who's asking about, you know, touching on uh, Tasha's point about food deserts and asking about how the people in that area can try and uh, revive what this she's saying used to it the area used to have a fantastic market local foods and small growers and you know wanting to sort of you know do something to inject a bit more of that back into the local area and it's interesting you you, you say it can be quite organic and it can come from people who have energy and creativity mm -hmm. and desire you know, to do that in an area um i'm going to move on to other questions because we have we have a lot coming in um patrick i'm going to come to you for this um we have someone worrying um certainly unfortunately correctly um about the impact of furlough um ending and people having less and less money to spend and increasing job losses and um, this person is wondering and worrying about the impact on that on farmers and producers having to cut prices in in this scenario yes i think it is this is a worry you know food pricing has already come up and uh, a lot of farmers have just become the big bigger farmers have just become commodity slaves selling food at or even below the cost of production and they just don't know what to do at the moment and i think that the alternative which is what the road we've gone down because it may sound strange to say this but we've got an 80 cow dairy herd and a lot of the family farms with that number of cows in the herd have just gone out of business because they the milk price they got was below the cost of production we've only managed to survive here by adding value to the milk by making it into cheese but of course, even our cheese is out of reach of a lot of people who would like to eat good cheese, but just simply can't afford the price difference. So this is a huge and important issue. And I think that the, the conversation you've just had with Darren about the importance of local markets and farmers markets cannot be overstated. And in a way, we need the farmers market movement to get bigger, because if you only have a market once a fortnight or something like that, then you can't form a habit of food buying in your local farmer's market. And certainly around here in Wales, as Darren was just saying, some uh, local authorities were really enlightened and some of them were just struck with fear about social distancing. And a lot of them got closed down for that reason. And yet the ones that have stuck with, you know, keeping the markets open and have maybe even increased the frequency of the markets, this provides a genuine alternative outlet for hard-pressed farmers who need to add value and sell direct to consumers. So I think there's a huge question here. What is the, if we're going to completely transform our food systems, is it revolution with kind of orthodoxy challenging, disruptive new models of getting food to people who want to buy it, genuine food? Or is it evolution through, you know, shaming the supermarkets and getting them to adopt better practices, which they are definitely not doing at the moment? It's probably a combination of both, mm -hmm. but I think we need a lot more ground up stuff. And it is a worry that as furloughs, furloughing ends and people get you know, made redundant, a lot of people will, no doubt, um, then people are gonna have less money to spend on food. Yeah. 
Darren, you, you let your work say Well, it's also about, you know, what you do there is you shorten the supply chain. Um, yeah. So you have a, a fewer, a smaller number of people taking a bite out of every cherry before it ends up in, in your shopping basket. And um, we talked a lot about physical markets here, but one of the other things that's happened, it's accelerated significantly during COVID, is people buying through uh, online means. Yeah. Um, you know, you can now buy fish straight from the quay um, in a way in which you couldn't do before. And some of that's been borne out of necessity because those those fishermen would be able to move their catch um, on bulk elsewhere uh, and they weren't able to do that. And I just hope that kind of thing sticks with people. I hope that becomes a new way of life that, that you know, you might not do it for your routine shop because, you know, at the end of the day, we all need to buy a loo roll. Um, but um, for the stuff that, you know, is that, that brings that joy to your life, Tasha, that, that that's that fun stuff. Uh, that you can buy it through the internet and you can buy it direct from suppliers um, and then it becomes a you know it becomes more affordable you know clearly if you produce food in a low yield very high quality way that food is going to cost more than something which is pumped full of hormones and uh, pesticides and and god knows what else um, uh, to maximize yield that's going to cost more money. Um, but I think... Can you know, I say as... something about that, John? Mm. That we, we need a new way of measuring food quality based mm. on nutrition per acre, not just yield per acre. Absolutely. And if we could, if we could measure food uh, nutrient density in a reliable way and give and power people who buy food to know the difference, that would be really amazing because I think so many of the small and artisan producers produce more nutritionally dense food uh, than all these huge sort of monocultures of say carrots in the east of England where actually a carrot isn't what it used to be and there there is evidence to show that the mineral and trace element and micronutrient content of food has gone down by maybe 50 percent in some vegetables during the time I've been farming. Yeah. But, but also um, Andrew if I, I can't if you yeah. buy loose if you buy loose weight you buy what you need rather than what somebody else tells you you need mm. so therefore it might be more expensive by the kilo but you buy what you need so you don't end up chucking half of it away so you know Tasha you were talking about the sort of the the the, the, the two for one offers and things like that and the discounting that goes on um, in some areas of, of the retail trade that's encouraging you to buy stuff you don't need that doesn't that it looks like it's cheap it looks like it's good value but it's not because that stuff's perishable um and you end up throwing it away so if you buy only what you need if you buy it in season um and if you buy it direct from the the producer or from a very very short supply chain it can become much more affordable if you look at your diet overall yeah. um Darren, i'm sorry i'm just gonna quickly interrupt um because we are already overrunning but that's not what i'm interrupting because we're gonna we are going to overrun now because we have a question which i really do want us to um get to and tasha i'm going to come to you for this um uh this question about no deal brexit um and i think it's important to um to, to sort of, you know, raise that given everything in the last couple of days and the question is specifically about no deal and the potential impact of the lowering of food standards in the food retail landscape tasha would you like to tackle that I'm so glad this question is coming. I knew you were going to love it. I'm so glad. Honestly, I do believe like, that the trade deals, the negotiations that are going on right now could be the biggest change to young people's health, to Britain's diet in general. I'm especially concerned about any trade deal that comes out of, you know, the US. We know Trump is very much vocal about him being anti clear labels. He's not interested in warning consumers, you know, when food has been genetically modified or when it's high in salt, fat and sugar. So I do think we need to use our voices to make sure that even when there is a deal, that deal still prioritises health, it maintains animal welfare, it maintains environmental standards, because we do have really high food standards in the UK compared to other countries and it's about making sure how do we maintain those and also you know I do hope that no I don't hope that I know trade deal you know situation does go on because that would be terrible um but also it's 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 all very uncertain, really, isn't it? It's all very uncertain. What is it that's going to happen? But whatever outcome it is, I honestly do pray to the gods above that our health, our food standards, everything is somewhat maintained and protected. 
Tasha, thank you very much. Um, we obviously could go on and on and on. And the thing is, this conversation is going to go on and on and on, not just with us tonight, but happily, we are in a time where this is a very, very live conversation and incredibly important and increasingly important. Um, and certainly one of the things you know, which I think has really come out today is the message of you know, there is no such thing as cheap food. And I, and I think you know, we, there is a growing understanding of that in the food system and how we can all you know, impact upon those things and make those choices that are better for us and they're better for to everybody. Um, huge thanks to you all, Darren Hennehan, Patrick Holden, Jenny Linford, Natasha Makiokora. Um, it was an absolutely fascinating session. So, so many questions and not just questions, but lovely feedback coming in from the audience as well. So I think you've really kind of got people thinking and really got people very engaged in, um, in the subject. Um, huge thanks to you guys. Huge thanks to KitchenAid, who are the supporters of the food season. Um, only one more event to come in the British Library food season. That's on Tuesday next week, where we will be with Tom Kerridge at the Hand and Flowers. Um, a very interesting discussion, I'm sure that's going to be. Um, you will find on your screen uh, a place to leave feedback about the event if you'd like to, and also to donate to the work of the British Library if you'd like to support that. Um, but for now, um, huge thanks again the panel um, and thank you all for watching British Library Food Season. <laughs>